this is the uh, <laughs> this is the final object that I made, uh, the culmination of all of my efforts. What is this uh, exactly? You know, you have a you have a plane of some kind, right? And then you have uh, some collection of uh, magnets on the plane. Like, let's say you have a really like long pendulum hanging, something magnetic over here. You kind of uh, mark the location above which the uh, pendulum starts. You specify colors for these magnets. So you can specify this one is red, maybe this one is blue, maybe this one is uh, green. And uh, you know, you let uh, this magnet go and you see, you know, it'll, it'll do some stuff and eventually it'll wind up over one of them. So for example, if at the end it winds up over the uh, red magnet, you would color this pixel uh, red. It turns out the system is uh, inc inc incredibly chaotic. If you change the magnet's initial position even slightly, that will, that could potentially change what magnet uh, it uh, lands over. Uh, a long time ago, I did a video on uh, chaos theory. And uh, in that video, I made some of these uh, animations and I wanted to explore the idea a little bit further. In this animation, what I'm showing is like the, the paths of all of these uh, magnets. Um, but you can also just think about the images that you would get uh, at the bottom, you know, just uh, the images where you color every pixel, you know, based on what magnet it lands over. If you simplify it a little bit, basically there are three uh, kind of forces acting on this. There's like this force that depends on this distance, you know, between each of the magnets and um, this object or each of the metallic pieces and this magnet, each of these will give you a, a vector, right? Uh, which will create a force that comes from, you know, however, the distance between a magnet and a, you know, a metallic object. I, I believe it's a, like a one over R cube thing instead of a one over R squared thing. Um, and then uh, there's also like friction involved. So, you know, if this thing is moving around, it should be slowing down as it goes, there should be some dissipation, some energy loss uh, within the system. And uh, apart from that, there's also gravity, right? There's a, you know, a, <laughs> something that points this, uh, you know, straight downward. So there's a, a force pointing straight uh, downward at every point. And this is going to be essentially the, uh, the, the, the differential equation that we are interested in solving. And so, you don't really solve this. You uh, you kind of approximate a solution of this using various discrete uh, methods. And the method that you want to use in this case is a method called a Beeman, the Beeman integration scheme. I basically just used uh, these two equations down here. You approximate the position at the time after the current time using the position at the previous time plus uh, the velocity times uh, dt, which is the change in time, plus uh, one sixth acceleration, acceleration at the previous time. And then there's a velocity term as well that you need to approximate because these equations involve velocity as well, because that plays a role in the friction portion of the equation, right? Okay, so you have that. And then how do you approximate uh, acceleration at the next time? The, uh, the way you approximate acceleration at the next time is just a discretized version of this exact equation. And then when you know how to update your acceleration, you use the equations in the uh, the Beeman integration scheme to update the next position and the next velocity. And then using those, you update the next acceleration, then you update position, velocity, then acceleration, then position, then velocity, and the acceleration. And that will allow you to kind of trace a path. For a hundred by hundred grid of magnets, that's a 10,000 magnets. I'm running the simulation for 20 seconds. The magnets are positioned at uh, the three vertices of an equilateral triangle. And then you use the Beeman integration scheme to kind of update the positions of the magnets. So if I hit enter over here, the computer will go through the incredibly labor intensive process of uh, computing the trajectories of all 10,000 magnets and seeing which magnet uh, it winds up closest to. So hopefully that makes sense. So despite my best efforts to get this to run as quickly as humanly possible, in Mathematica, this is still unfortunately incredibly, incredibly slow. So here's uh, the image that you get. So the co I, I set it to do random colors, 
So, but that's still really interesting, I think. I mean, it shows the uh, the chaotic nature of the system. So you see this uh, pool of light green points means uh, if the magnet started hanging over at this position, it ends close to this green magnet. Or if the magnet started here close to this uh, pink position, it ends over this uh, pink position. And similarly over here, if the magnet starts close to this dark green position, it ends over this dark green position. But as the magnet gets uh, further and further away, it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting, right? It's trajectories become uh, increasingly chaotic. So you can't quite tell for any of these points on the outside, where exactly the where exactly the magnet will land if you if you let it go so that's really nice and uh, you get kind of a very beautiful picture but it does lead me to think you know if it were possible to get a higher resolution maybe i could get an even better picture there's something in, in, in Python which uh, I've learned about, which I think is really, really amazing. I kind of, I'm kind of excited to share it with you. Um, so it's called a broadcasting. So here's, uh, here's how a broadcasting works. It's kind of weird, but I, I've, I've really fallen in love with it. It's like what my favorite thing ever right now. Whenever you're having to deal with the matrices, some poor soul with a numerical analysis PhD has worked on those algorithms uh, very, very carefully. So, so like, let's say you have a two dimensional array that you're dealing with. If you can avoid looping over every entry of that two dimensional array and just use the array as like a thing and have it interact with other arrays, that will generally run significantly faster. Actually, this is something that we we need to do. So like, you know, let's say you have a list of positions. So these would be uh, the positions of the pendulum, right? And uh, let's say you have a list of the magnet positions. If for every position of every pendulum and every magnet position, you have to loop through and figure out all of their uh, distances, that's kind of a brutal nightmare, <laughs> right? In terms of for loops, you'd have to loop over all the positions and loop over all the magnet positions and take all of their differences. So let's say you have an array. So let's say you have an array that is uh, n by m. And let's say you have another array that is uh, n by one. Let's say this uh, first array is uh, a, and the second array is b. If I, in Python, write a plus b, so you're adding an n by m with an n by one array. Technically, that should not be possible. If this dimension is a one, it treats it like an m. If you're adding an n by m array, and I'm adding it to an n by one array, n rows, one column, what Python will do is it'll just, the in the answer, it'll basically add this entry to each number in the first row. It'll add this entry to each number in the second row, and it'll add e this entry to each number in the third row, and so on and so forth, thereby resulting in, again, an n by m matrix. So instead of treating this as an n by one, it takes m copies of the n by one. So if this is like a, you know, if this was like one, two, three, four, five, uh, it'll take, it'll just make m copies of the one, two, three, four, five, and just add them up over here. I had a two by like a, a two dimensional array of uh, magnet position. So you can imagine if it's a hundred by hundred, you know. So I, it's a hundred by hundred. This is let's say at time t. I also uh, let's say I'm, uh, uh, let's say the number of magnets I have at the bottom of the plane is uh, three. So let's say I have three magnets here that I'm trying to do this uh, simulation over. So then, so at time t, I also have, you know, a, a three by one array of magnets, right? Now, what if I want to compute the distance between each of these positions and each of these magnets? So the positions is 100 by 100. The magnets is uh, three by one. I'm going to uh, just add an axis. So I'll make this a one by 100 by 100. That just amounts to putting an extra bracket outside this matrix, right? And then what I'll do is add a bracket around each entry of this so that this becomes three by one by one. Aha, so now if I say to Python, do positions minus magnets, 
it will treat this one like a three. It'll treat this bottom one like a hundred and this will treat, treat this bottom one like a hundred. So if I add these axes, so if I put the one axis in front of the hundred by hundred, and if I put the, the two axes at the end of M and I just do P minus M, I will get an answer that is a three by 100 by 100 matrix that will contain the differences between all of the positions and all of the magnets in one step. <laughs> Tell me how awesome is that, right? So it's just one line of code can do that for you. So this is the same simulation, five magnets. Uh, let me run it. Uh, so 90,000 positions are being uh, simulated for 10 seconds. And then you see, so you get a color based on what magnet it winds up uh, closest to. Let me run the same simulation, but for like, uh, say 50 seconds. See, it now gets a lot, uh, a lot messier, a lot messier. The issue is with this code, um, it's running in Python. And this is, this is as, I mean, I'm sure some like Python genius could get it to work even faster in Python, but I wanted it to work faster still. In particular, I wanted to know how, how is it exactly that this, that this is what it looks like at 10 seconds, right? Turns into this. So this is what it looks like at uh, 50 seconds. So that's what I was really interested in. I wanted to see how the closest magnet diagram changed over the course of the next 40 seconds. And Python is not fast enough to give me those frames in real time. My next master plan was to use a shader. So I've never used a shader before. So this is a shading language. What makes this really powerful is you can, you can actually send instructions directly to your graphics card almost. So for each pixel, you can send in parallel an instruction to your graphics card and say to it, okay, I want you to follow these instructions in order to figure out how I would like you to color each pixel. There's this online tool that I highly recommend. It's called Shader Toy. So Shader Toy, um, they basically take care of all of the boilerplate code for you, uh, all of the boilerplate OpenGL kind of code for you. So you can just program in the uh, shader. And so that was really, really useful to me. So there are three magnets and the color is based on uh, what magnet the pendulum is closest to. So at time zero, all the pendulums that start kind of in this area should be closest to this magnet, right? And all the pendulums that start in this area should be close to this magnet. And all the pendulums that start down here should be closest to this magnet, right? But if I let time progress, all the pendulums start moving around and the situation gets more and more chaotic and okay, it's going. <laughs> Come on. Oh, that's so beautiful. Tell me you don't like that. <laughs> I also darken the pixel based on the length of the path and that gives it a, a kind of depth, right? It, 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 makes, it makes the drawing look more, more dynamic and, uh, and, and uh, interesting. By the way, uh, for this one, as opposed to uh, this one, I turned the uh, friction up slightly just so you would get a, a prettier picture. And I do think that that is just beautiful. Let's try four magnets. Also, I just realized that I can like full screen this. Hopefully it doesn't break the stream. Um, but there you go. So, so this is uh, what it looks like. This is the chaos of uh, a million magnets, <laughs> a million magnetic pendulums being, uh, being swung around. Anyways, I'm really proud of this. Um, you know, I'm proud that you can send these instructions directly to the graphics card and, you know, simulate all 1 million of them in real time in order to get these animations. So that's really cool. So it starts out as a Voronoi. It'll always start out as a Voronoi diagram.
Ooh, I love when the like when the when the darkness comes in from the uh, the the uh, path links. That looks really beautiful. Oh, by the way, I'll uh, put this up. Actually, you can go to Shader Toy. I'll make it public. I'll include a link in the description when I put out the edit and uh, you can just play with it yourself on, uh, on Shader Toy. Just be warned, the code is terrible. Like all my code is atrocious. I'm going to try and do only streams on Wednesdays from now on. So I still I still work full time. I don't have time to do two videos and two edits, uh, but people really seem to like the edits. So I figured I would do one video and one edit every week. I stream from now on every Wednesday and uh, I'll edit it down within the next like couple days. Thank you all so much for coming by. Um, you're all the best. You're all amazing. I love you all. And uh, I don't know what else to say. So peace. <laughs>